can you see the clear distinction between those three images? Can yes. you deduce what view we're doing on each one? What position? Yes. What's the clear What's the clear indications, guys? Okay. AP. AP. We can see the superior medial section of this joint, but this is completely closed off over here. Can y'all see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mortis. Everything's mm -hmm. open mm -hmm. on the angle mm -hmm. joints. But for the 45 degree oblique, what's the star of our show? Lateral. These lateral joints right here, the distal tip fib and the lateral side of the mortise right here. Please know how to distinguish all three of these guys. Um, one thing you also look to is if the collation is open enough, if you look down here at the metatarsals, you can see just how rotated they are a lot of times. Um, I think your book has a couple of examples of that as well. But don't depend on that because if they're collating like they should, we're not going to see all that anyway. So go by the joints, that's your better way of figuring out those different positions. They're showing you how that gap widens as well. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. AP, if you look at the gap between the tip, it's extremely thin. The mortise, it's a little bit bigger, and the oblique, it's very, very open. And so that's because of the obliquity? Question? So yes. For, yeah, for the, when you rotate medially, is, is the beam going through the lateral side first and then coming out immediately? Yes, it is. More so. More so. It's still considered an AP, yeah. but it's more so in the lateral aspect, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it would be considered a lateral medial? Beam? I think it would still be the AP. It's yeah. just, even though, yes, it's somewhat on the lateral aspect, it's still considered AP. It's not enough on the lateral aspect. Okay. All right, here's that one that we should always do, correct? No. Okay. Uh, sure? Positive. I mean, this is only a tech exam, yes? False. You said bong? False. Oh, you said false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just call Mr. Fong, like, hey, I heard you can do this. Help me out. Help me out. Uh, please write that down, guys. That is a registry question as well when it comes to these stress views. It should only be done by. Positions only. It's even in your book. That's not just Mr. Donahue saying that. So how do we do this? Same as an AP. The position is going to place the foot in extreme inversion and eversion positions. What's inversion and eversion? That's way back to semester one. Inversion, 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 inversion. inversion, inversion, inversion how we twist the foot. Mm -hmm. So once again, the reason the position is going to do this is because if there is already a fracture in place or torn ligaments and tendons. You don't want to be anywhere near that position because why we're doing extreme inversion and extreme eversion. They're really going to put the stress on the ankle, so to speak. See what I did there? <laughs> My jokes just aren't working today. Really. Um, of course, immobilization of that stress position is going to be necessary as well. A lot of times they will utilize little pieces of tape, um, sheets, but most often the position themselves, as they should be, We'll be in there with a lead jacket manipulating that foot for you, getting that ankle in those extreme inversion and eversion positions. Now, why do we do this, guys? The main reason, even though there might be fractures yeah. present, is to verify ligament tears. And they'll determine if they need to send them to MRI or not. So look at that further. It's kind of like a precursor to those MRIs they can have to check those ligaments out. So I'm saying this again, guys, because you're going to have techs that try to do this themselves. They should never be doing that. And if they ever ask you to do this, say no. If they get upset at you, they can call me. I'll fuss at them for you. You should never, ever, ever do this, period. You can lose your licensure. You can get in really big trouble for doing these. And I have confirmation made that some techs do these in cl bone clinic. They should not be doing these. You have a question, Billy? Yeah. Is this related to, like, you know when somebody says, like some liquid is coming out and they need surgery. <laughs> Liquid's coming out. Yeah, you know how there's like some, you have liquid in like, I think it's like your knee and then your also. It's about fluid. I think so. And is this related to that? Like, I don't know. This is, this is for ligaments, not for joint capsules. Okay. That'd be more for an arthrogram, hey. which you're speaking on. Hey. Oh, you knew that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So this is an example of the eversion and the inversion. Can you tell which is which? The one on the left. Let's start with the one on the left. What is that? Inversion. Eversion. E Why? Because we're going lateral. The one on the right would be inversion. Inversion. So they're mainly looking at 
these areas here for both because that's where those ligament attachments are. We're going to see if they're uh, we're going to see how flexible it is first of all, and they'll be able to feel if they're a good doctor. If there's some tears going on there. Um, kind of like that precursor once again to an MRI, which gives us a better visualization because we cannot see ligaments and tendons on X-rays. We can on MRIs. Did it on you? Did the patient not do that themselves? They shouldn't because they could actually hurt themselves as well. It's once again, physician only, physician only. And you're not gonna see that. I, I hate to say you're not gonna see that. You're gonna see a lot of techs doing it themselves, but they should not ever be doing that. Yes? Is there a reason they would choose to do that one or the reason they would do this before MRI? Because they can usually determine if the MRI is necessary or not. If there's actual tears going on. It's like a little pre almost like a pre-op, you know, it's not a surgery, like a pre, like a scalp almost, like a scalp image for the MRI in a lot of ways. All right, this should look familiar. Weight-bearing AP. Where did we just do one of these? On the feet, right? Same thing, same concept, guys. We're basically just the exact same way as the feet. We're just gonna be focusing on the ankles instead. So, patient will be upright on a low platform block, just staying on something just like this. I should say same with the heels, not the hells. You know, it is Halloween, so I guess, you know, you know um, I guess our devil over here can tell us more about this. Yes. How do you stand with Cal pushed against the IR? <laughs> you want to know. Um, heels pushed against the IR, very important to what? Why would we want the heels pushed up against the IR? Uh, well, I, Reduce that OID, yes. Toes should be pointed nice and straight. And why do we do this? We want to identify ankle joint space narrowing. So to your point, you just brought up Emily. Um, Melanie. Why don't you explain this? Melanie. Oh, it's different. Sorry. No, your names are too similar. Y'all look the same. Melanie. Melanie. Melanie, Melanie. If there is some loss of that joint space in the synovial cavity around the ankle joint, they can visualize that a little better with those stress views because we're putting what? We're putting gravity right. on those joints mm -hmm. and that those joints kind of act as a cushion, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's um, a degradation of the ankle joint, we can see if those bones are grinding against each other. Often we'll see it more so in the knees and the ankles, but it can happen with the ankles as well. And you, as you can imagine, those bones are rubbing up against each other, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable, very painful, and they're eroding each other. Mm. Those bones can erode down. All right, central ray will be perpendicular, no angulation. We're gonna put it in between the malleoli. So basically in between both medial malleoli is where your crosshair is gonna go. In between both medial malleoli. So it's gonna show both our ankle joints, it's gonna show the relationship of the tip fib with a weight bearing view. We're gonna compare the joints and see if that synovial cavity is working properly. See so if they need to have an arthrogram done. So you'll see these a lot in your outside clinics, not so much at the hospitals. It's more of a clinic type exam. Has anyone seen these or just the feet? I've seen the feet. Usually, usually feet are more common than ankles. Feet and knees. So we're centered, feet and knees. We're centered at the malleoli, but in between both feet. In between both those medial malleoli. Yep. Because anytime you see that word weight bearing, we're checking joints out. That's the main reason we do it to check how check the integrity of those joints, make sure there are actual joint spaces left. Especially as you get older, a lot of people lose that. Are these gonna be done unilateral or bilateral? They should always be done bilateral because they want to compare the two. Now, for the lateral, of course, we won't be able to do that bilateral. We'll have to do that one time. The same reason as the feet. All right, so our evaluation criteria, guys. Well, of course, what's the start of our show? Both ankle joints, we want both ankles centered with a medial mortise open, medial mortise. We also want the distal tib and talus partially superimposing the distal fibula and the lateral mortise closed. So we're only doing the AP, we're not doing the obliques on these. We're only gonna look at that medial mortise open and that lateral mortise closed. I'll give them enough information what they need to see to check the integrity of that synovial ankle joint capsule. And of course, we're gonna draw this on here with our digital markers, right? Standard. No. What should we do? 
place the marker that says standing? Believe it or not, yes, there are actual physical markers that say standing. <laughs> There's some that say flexion, some that say inversion, eversion. There are physical markers for everything. That's okay. always the preferred method, correct? Mm -hmm. Even though we're going to see a lot of text doing digital, we always put <laughs> physical, physical markers. Marker. Say it out loud so I can hear you. Physical. Oh, come on, guys. <laughs> we only use what? Physical, physical and anatomical markers. I swear, if y'all miss that on your registry, I'm going to hunt you down. Do not miss that on your registry. I'm going to hunt you down. If you fell your registry because of that question, I'm sorry. I did everything I could to help you. I'm not sorry. I just can't. I'm sorry. 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 I'm
I'm so sorry about oh, okay. this. So, That's like, I usually <laughs> want to put a shirt, but that's the first thing I'm going to put. Oh, sorry, forget. sorry, Tex. And then they'll be like, okay, I'm going to put a shirt. So, I mean, I have to, like, answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, as and nice as I can say, you got some texts that just do some really stupid stuff. You make note of the good practices. You also make note of the bad ones so you don't emulate that when you come in, become a tech. Or the ghost of Donahue Pass will haunt your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> and that does happen. All right. <laughs> so, of course, where our main artifacts are going to get in our way, guys. Same as what we already talked about. Shoes. Please, for the love of God, don't take an extra of the shoe on of the foot. I say that because I've seen someone actually do that. Yes. Who was it? They didn't go to this school. <laughs> Socks or hose, of course, can get in the way. Heavy fabrics, undergarments, such as underwear, if it's within the anatomy of interest. You don't have to tell them to take their underwear off if you're doing ankle x-rays. They're just going to think you're creepy for that. <laughs> and, of course, provide your patient with a proper butt gown for modesty. If you do remove the underwear, guys, what can we do to help with modesty? Gown. Double, okay. up, double up the gowns. Yeah. One in the front, one in the back. You offer that to your patients, guys. Don't have them exposing their rear end to the whole world. But they will do, do them they a favor. Give them two. Huh? When you do give them two, some of, some patients will still put one out and just come out. Well, you know, they are very comfortable with their bodies. I did that. I That's a particular group. I got a sheet and I just put yeah. it over her. Help them out. Help them out. You know, Grandma, she don't care no more. <laughs> hey, Grandpa, too. Grandpa, too. Grandma, too. Grandma, too. The, yeah, he's, the flashes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ambulatory patients. What's ambulatory mean, ladies and gentlemen? Walkie talkies. Walkie talkies. Walkie -talkies. Walkie -talkies. Walkie -talkies. They can be seated on the x ray table. We're going to put that affected extremity resting on the IR or on the table if it's in the bucket tray. Bucket tray for larger parts. That's going to apply directly to our knee exams and our femur when we talk about femur next chapter. All of our knee x-rays, aside from a few special views, will be in the table bucky, because it needs a much thicker area of penetration. Non-ambulatory guys, of course, we're going to maximize their comfort. Give them some pillows, give them blankets, double up those gowns. If they're comfortable, they're going to cooperate better with you. If you need to transfer them from the stretcher to the table, do so. But, you know, a lot of these we can actually do in the stretcher, especially if they come in with a shattered leg. You don't want to be moving them to a table anyway. You can get a lot of that cross table, tabletop, use a grid, whatever. There's other ways we can do this to maximize comfort and still get a good quality image. Like I said, use that grid IR for larger parts. If they come in with a shattered leg and you need to do a three view knee, remember we have grids. Have y'all seen grids before? Yes. You can put a grid on your cassette, clean up that image, and still get a good quality image without hurting your patient further by moving them to that table. Don't torture your patients. Of course, always use the smallest IR as possible when possible. It's always going to give your patient better protection, but it's also going to maximize your image quality. Do not do, once again, don't do a knee on a 14 by 17. You don't need the whole tip, you don't need the whole femur on there. The knee, you know, it's thicker, but it's small. Don't do it. It's just going to bring the image quality down. You're just going to look like a lazy, terrible tech anyway. Uh, don't do a toe on a 14 by 17. <laughs> don't do a toe on a 14 by 17. <laughs> uh, it wasn't you. Uh, that wasn't you. I've seen that, though. Um, some long bones, depending on the patient, this is more so for the femurs, guys. We'll talk more about this next chapter. Sometimes you have to do a little overlap to images because the femur is the longest and strongest bone in the body. If you try to put my femur on one x-ray, it's not going to fit. You need two, the upper and the lower. But some people can fit on one. It depends on the patient. Um, never use a larger than needed radiation field size. That should be obvious by now for protection purposes and quality purposes. Okay, everything's gonna be a nice 40 inch SID from here on out. There's still just one that has 48. That is the standing weight bearing apiaxial feet. Everything else in this chapter is 72 inches, right? Yeah. That's 40 inches. Let me make sure y'all paying attention. It's all 40 inches. When you're in, well, many of your entry choices will say 72 inches, but that should be easy to remember, yes? Yeah. 40 inches except for one apiaxial weight bearing feet. <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's see. Huh? They don't say yes, and they relate. I put the gifs in there for a reason. <laughs> they relate. <laughs> okay. Once again, guys, main point. I, I swear y'all gonna get tired of me saying this, but you know, my goal is for you to at least get this question right on your registry. Hopefully all of them, but at least you'll get this one right. We'll use that digital annotation. <laughs> <laughs> to place side markers on the images. I know this one. <laughs> They'll make it sound inviting, though. They'll give you a situational question. Like, oh, you know, this situation going on, and uh, blah, 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 blah. Is it still better to use digital? No. They'll give you a whole pretty 
beautiful paragraph that sounds all nice about digital, it's still always physical markers, yeah, period. I don't care what they say. Okay, so the value said this. Take example, they say, um, you sh already shot it and you forgot to use your physical markers, would you send it using digital or would you retake it and put oh, your that's a good question. What do, you, what do you think the answer is? You tell me. How would you answer that? That's a great example question. Per the curriculum, what do you think you would do? Not in real life. You would retake it and put the physical, yes. Per the curriculum, that's not common sense. You know, in real life, you probably would never do that. But per the curriculum, yes, we would repeat it with the physical marker. But that was so yeah. Radiation protection. They're not going to put those two together. Okay. <laughs> That's a great point to bring out, Ray. Great Sorry, example question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I escalated quickly. <laughs> All right, of course, guys, what else with brand protection? Close collimation, but once again, that doesn't only just help protect the patient, it helps increase your image quality. Anytime you not use that nice, tight collimation, I expect y'all to be doing so. Breathing instructions, we have them hold their breath for all our leg x-rays, yes? Yes. We got lungs in our feet. <laughs> I swear, if I get one more political ad call, I'm going to lose my mind. I hate election season. My phone just goes off every two seconds. <laughs> Have the patient hold still for you because we need them to hold still mm -hmm. to get that good quality image. By the way, I, I say this funny, but I already said this before, guys. You'd be surprised how I get people every year on this. Um, I say, learn the breathing instructions for an AP knee. Someone's going to say suspended respiration. I hope y'all don't do that. But I get to at least one person every year because we default to that naturally. Always asking about respiration. It's got to be expiration or inspiration. We don't talk about a freaking leg. You know, read your question carefully. There's no bringing instructions at all. All right, guys. So let's talk about the leg and the knee and the patella. You can omit femur. We will not be talking about femur this chapter. That will be on our next chapter. All right, so for the leg. Wow, I love this one. There's only two projections. AP and a lateral. That's our AP leg, or sometimes called the AP and lateral tib fib. Tibia fibula. Not fibia and tibula. I'll say it again, it's tibia and fibula, not tibula and fibia, which I've already heard some of y'all say. Don't say that in clinic. You'll laugh at you. Tibula. Tibula. Huh? It's easy to mix them up, especially if you're it is, it is, it's a common, common mistake. By the way, that lateral is only gonna be a medio lateral. Now I will say, in some instances, there does exist an oblique tib fib. Does anybody know why? I've done quite a few of them. The proximal, uh, right, the proximal tibial. Oh, I was thinking the same thing. Did you say why? Why would they ever do an oblique tip fib? You don't, it's not in your textbook. Fractures. Um, yes, for fractures. Mm -hmm. That is a specially ordered view when they suspect abuse on a pediatric. Mm -hmm. Because often hairline and green stick fractures will only show up on oblique tip fib x-rays. So anytime they had suspected abuse on a child in lower limbs, we would have an oblique tip fib ordered. Doesn't exist in the curriculum, but that's something they came up with at TCH that would be part of the protocols. So that's, fun fact there. That's somebody's like name for the position or whatever. Like they, mm. they coined that one. It was just called oblique. I don't know if it was I don't know if it's ever actually been named, but yeah, they were oral. There was yeah, a the, suspicion of abuse. Oblique, like the medial oblique. Medial, medial oblique. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the first AP leg, once again it's gonna be called AP leg or AP tip fib. Patient should be supine only. They will not be standing up for this x-ray. So for the park position, they're gonna be flat on their back. Be careful on this because when someone's hurting in their lower regions, what do they naturally do? Okay. Shift their weight, right? You ever see someone shifting their weight on their pelvis? Mm -hmm. Left and right, that will actually mess up your AP leg. Make sure they are nice and flat on their bottom. We do want Write this down, much like with the elbow, guys. That same concept, femoral condyles parallel to the IR. That means we're in a proper AP position. Also, because, like I mentioned before, the ankles and the x-ray, what must we do with the foot, guys? Dorsiflex that foot. Do not give me a floppy foot on that leg x-ray. Okay, IR needs to extend one to one and a half inches beyond the joints. 
situated to be perpendicular to the center of the leg. Now there's not an exact palpation point for the center of the leg, but what I taught people to do in lab was, you remember what we did, Nick? What did yeah. we do in lab? Didn't we uh, put like one on the knee, one on the ankle? Correct. One hand on the knee joint, one hand on the ankle joint, bring your thumbs together. That's the center of the two. Mm -hmm. If you're having trouble eyeballing that. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mr. Pong, he showed us that like yep. when we did the this, this together mm -hmm. works really well. Now you have the option of doing this two ways with your cassette. Now my personal recommendation guys is to always do this diagonal on the cassette. Yeah, yeah, Why? Because most people have longer legs and it's going to be very hard to get it all to fit on one vertical cassette. Unless you just have a really short person with short stubby legs, you need to do that nice diagonal cassette to fit it all in one because hopefully you're going to get it all on one x-ray and not have to do it upper and lower. Mm -hmm. Now you have people with very long legs. I have long legs. I might need to upper and lower on mine, but um, if you can get it on one. Now what determines if you get it all in one? Only if you have both joints clearly on the film. Even though the star of our show is the tip fit, we need to see the knee joint and the ankle joint in full. It's very important. Very, very important. If we do not, we got to do a specialized view. Let's say if I do a AP leg and I can see the ankle joint but not the knee, I need to do a specialized AP knee just to see that AP knee joint. Not repeat the whole thing, but just show off the knee joint. You have to see both the ankle and the knee joint. Correct. Mm -hmm. Question, Jay? Um, you might have already said it, but did you? Uh, is this dorsiflex as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it is. Because the ankle's on there and we are interested in the joints, we're going to dorsiflex that foot. Okay. Absolutely. All right, so look at that optimal one on the left. Isn't that the most optimal tip that you ever did see? Mm -hmm. No, it is not. It's <laughs> not. <laughs> that's that's right. what I said. Yeah, Why is that not optimal? Oh, yeah, the floppy foot and there's no floppy foot. Well, we don't have a floppy foot, but we're missing the knee joint completely on that x-ray. Which is the one on the right, we've got what? The full ankle joint and the full knee joint. Even though we don't see all the femur, we see the full knee joint. And then you put them together, they look good. Yes, yes. All right, so what are we looking at, guys? The tip, the fib, and both adjacent joints. So once again, the star of our show is tip, fib, and the knee joint and ankle joint. Okay, so ankle and knee joints on one or more images, ideally and optimally all on one. Leg without rotation. How do we know there's no rotation? We look to the proximal and distal articulations of the tib and the fib moderately being overlapped. And we look for the fibula mid shaft to be free of superimposition. So, with that information, mm -hmm. we already know we cut the knee off here, but what else is wrong with this x ray on the left? Nick just said it's rotated. How do we know? Look how thin this division is right here. Ideally, we want a space about like this right here, guys. This tells us that the patient has been rotated because that space is closing off. So that, uh, this is a more true AP on the right. And they got some really nasty fractures going on there. Which way are they rotated? They are rotated more so to the lateral side. If it was medial, if it was more medial, you'd see the joints opening up more. Let's go to our lateral leg. And once again, this is going to be what kind of projection? A medial lateral projection. It enters the medial side, exits the lateral side of the leg. We are going to rotate the patient on their affected side. So if the right leg's hurting, I'm rotating the patient to the right side. Mm -hmm. If the left leg's hurting, I'm rotating them to the left side, rotating on the area where they're having pain, the area of interest. The lateral surface of the leg will be what's resting on the IR. Very important for this position to be in a correct true lateral, patella must be perpendicular to the IR, or another way of saying the patella must be in a nice true lateral, nice true lateral. Femoral condyles will now be superimposed and perpendicular to the IR. Really great test question there. AP, the femoral condyles are parallel. Lateral, they are super, superimposed and perpendicular to that IR. Now this is something I actually do. You can actually flex the knee to get a better true lateral. That's going to help you get those condyles nicely superimposed. It's going to get that patella nice and true lateral as well. Because what people tend to do that's really bad on this x-ray is they'll just put the leg straight out on its side and usually the condyles will be rotated. They won't be superimposed on each other. And the patella won't even have a nice joint space with it either. 
Everything's going to be kind of jacked up on the proximal side of that knee. Like the AP, we do need to include both joints, knee joint and ankle joints. And ideally, I do recommend, once again, you guys do this diagonal. You're just going to have a lot less of a struggle getting all those joints, or both those joints on that IR in one nice image. Now, it's not in here, but what do you think is causing me a lot of you know, indigestion right now based on this position? Oh. <laughs> Let's give me some acid reflux right now because I'm just burning up seeing this. The light field. Mm -hmm. Who's said floppy foot? Floppy foot is not. You see that floppy foot? foot? Yeah. Can we have a floppy foot? No. We cannot. We need dorsiflexion because the ankle is in the field of view. Don't do this. They will send that back to you. At least where I used to work, they will. No floppy feet. Dorsiflex that foot. All right. Alternative method. Patient cannot be turned from the supine position, of course. Just like anything else, we can do a cross table lateral. A lot of your patients come in with really bad tip fib fractures like the image we just looked at earlier. They're of course not gonna be able to turn their leg because you know it's broken half. So what can you do? Support the leg either with sheets or pillows or have someone hold it up for you. Put the film on the side, shoot cross table, you can still get that nice, beautiful lateral. It's always an alternative for all of your extremity x-rays, cross table laterals. Thinking outside the box a little bit. Um, so perpendicular central ray, midpoint of the leg once again. We're going to be looking at that tibia, tibia, the fibula, and both of those adjacent joints, that being the knee joint and the ankle joints. Shame on you, Meryl. I should put that in your book. That's terrible. I speak so highly of Meryl. What an ugly mm -hmm. position. All right, what's our evaluation criteria? Well, stars of our show, guys. Of course, the tibia and the fibula in a true lateral position. Ankle and knee joints on one or more images, preferably all on one. Distal fibula will be superimposed by the posterior half of the tibia. There will be slight overlap between the tib and the fibular head. And separation of the tibial, tibial, bleh, 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 tibial and fibular <laughs> bodies, not at the ends, it's talking about the midsection right here and in a possible reduced superimposition of the femoral condyles. One thing you might note of, I, I have seen this as a registry review question. They often talk about when you're in a nice true lateral for tib-fib, how is the tibia related to the fibula? Well, the tibia will look anterior to the fibula. The fibula will be posterior to the tibia. Does that make sense? Or anterior versus posterior? Know how those lie in relation to each other? That has shown up on the registry review questions. A nice true lateral, the tibia will sit anterior to the fibula, the fibula will sit posterior to the tibia. Question? Yeah. Do you have distal fibula which is turned right here. It's not this area right here. Posterior, um, posterior half of the tibia is overlapping the distal portion of the fibula right here, which you can see right here. And this is a nice true lateral once again. How do we know? Look at those femoral condyles. See how superimposed they are? Mm -hmm. If this was rotated, when you see those condyles separated, we'd also see that knee joint closed off. So the patella's in a nice true lateral, condyles are superimposed, tibia's in the front of the fibula, of course, nice free ankle joint down here. So a lot going on in that image, actually, what we can check. It looks a little bright, Mr. Donahue. It is a little bright. It looks like it's hard around this. I always think it's kind of interesting. Look how, this is why it hurts so bad when you hit your shin. You ever hit your shin on something? It hurts really bad. Yeah. Look how little tissue is on the front versus the back. You got all that muscle behind your leg, but in the front, it's basically just like skin and bone. Yeah. Thankfully, the larger bones in the front, the smaller ones a little more posterior, right? So why do we do an AP? Why do we do an AP? Two legs, like, since all the, isn't there an OID when you do an AP? There is going to be slight OID, yes, but, oh, that's a good question. I guess it would just be less than ideal trying to get a patient PA for a leg, especially if it's broke. Be, and you wouldn't be able to dorsiflex yeah, the foot okay. either. Um, the way too. That's a good question. I've never thought about that. Also, you ever tried putting weight on your patella, especially if it's broke? 
probably not a good idea. So it's uncomfortable doing that when it's not broke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to the knee, guys. Now the knee is going to have, we don't have much time left, but the knee is going to have a lot of projections, guys. This will be what we call our more so routine exams. There's going to be quite a few specialized exams we're going to go over as well, such as the Holmblad, the Kelp Coventry, the Houston Method. Not quite like Houston Method. Right? Like huh? It's H E G H S T O N, by the way, not Houston, Texas. Or like Huxton. But a lot of um, alternative methods for that interconjular fossa that we talked about before. But we're going to start with our routines right here. We have the AP, the lateral, which is still only a medial lateral projection. We have those weight bearing knees, which you'll see in your clinics. Mm -hmm. And then two obliques. And most of the time on the knee, you're always going to do both those obliques, the lateral and the medial, if they order those as part of the series. and the medial obliques. Yeah, we're in the end game now. It means there's not much more to go. <laughs> sort of. All right, AP knee, guys. Of course, for AP knee, we're not doing standing, therefore we're just going to be supine. Flat on our backs. We're going to put our IR half an inch below the patellar apex. Where is the apex of the patella located? The top or the bottom? Oh. Oh, very good, on the bottom. Our femoral epicondyles, just like the AP leg we just talked about, they will be parallel with our cassette. We can actually feel that on the sides of the femur. We want them nice and parallel with the cassette, no rotation. Knee does need to be fully extended if possible. That can be impossible if they have a really bad fracture of the knee area. They may have that knee permanently flexed, of which you'll just have to work around that. We'll talk about methods for that as well. But if they can extend that knee fully, it doesn't need to be so to be a nice true AP. Now, what do y'all know about angulations with the AP knee? What did y'all learn in lab? If is it average, all the same or is it different? It's, it's different. different. It's different, right? Depending on what? The body habits. The body habits, where specifically? The asses. What do we measure? Oh, yeah. The asses. Yes. The, the as is the, the pelvis, pelvis, right? We measure the pelvis to determine what kind of angulation we're going to add to the knee. Okay. It's very important to know because a lot of people, when they see it in a question, they say, well, I'm measuring the knee because the knee x-ray. We're actually measuring the pelvis to determine how we angle for the knee because depending on how thick the pelvis is, mm -hmm. our bodies will naturally lie differently on the table. Not all pelvises are created alike. So here we go, guys. That's what it's going to look like right there. We base this on centimeters. Did y'all use y'all's calipers in lab? Mm -hmm. Little calipers? Mm -hmm. You do need to measure for these on these because it makes a <laughs> subtle but better difference. Did I miss something? No, it's, we didn't do that. Y'all yeah. didn't do this. Oh, yeah. no. We did. We did. We did. We did. Uh, for us, just uh, do five degrees. So yeah. I'll get to that. That's not a bad piece of advice because yeah, me, typically, as a technologist, I always default to five. But per the curriculum, for a more optimized image, this is what we should be doing right here. So I'll admit, as a tech, I never did measure the pelvis because I was always defaulted to five degree angulation. That was always the best. That's, that's not bad advice. That's not bad advice. So per the curriculum, guys, once again, per the curriculum, not real life, make the distinction per the curriculum and what the registry will ask is, is variable depending on this body habitus on the pelvis, specifically the as is the tabletop measurements. We will use the calipers to measure the as is, and if they are below 19 centimeters, we're gonna use a three to five degree caudad angulation. I've never in my life used that angulation, and I've done a lot of children x-rays. If they're 19 to 24, we're gonna use a perpendicular angulation. I've never in my life used that angulation even on children. If they're greater than 24, we're going to utilize a three to five degrees cephalic angle. This is your optimal angulation almost every time here, guys. Mm -hmm. Just as some of y'all learn lab, that's what I've always done for knee x-rays, and they always look beautiful. But per the curriculum, guys, please write that down. Put a star on it. This is variable depending on the measurement of the as is to the tabletop, and that central rate will enter half an inch below the patellar apex, not directly on it. So just directly below but you can feel the patella apex right below it in that knee joint for that x-ray. 
So once again, even though you're seeing this in real life done differently, per the curriculum, make note that it is variable. You will see questions on this, guys. Make that very clear. That is going to change the thing on the measurement that body fat is. This one works the best almost every time. Still writing or? Okay. Good? All right, so how do you measure? Put the calipers, you find the as is, you put the calipers between the bottom and the as is. You measure it right there. All right, this will be our last slide of the day here, guys. So we're going to see, of course, all the knee structures. We want nice, good, tight collimation. We want that knee fully extended if possible. Once again, there's, if there's times where you can't get that knee fully extended, especially if it's fractured or dislocated, but we will learn methods to work around it as we move forward. How do we know the knees without rotation? Four very important points, guys. We want symmetric femoral condyles, or we want to ensure that both those condyles are parallel to our cassettes. Interconjular eminence should be nice and center. We should see two little mountain ranges here, right? Mm -hmm. If we see one, we got a big problem. There should be two little mountain ranges between the plateaus. Don't remember y'all's anatomy? Mm -hmm. No, forgot it, right? Two plateaus, mm -hmm. two little mountains? Mm -hmm. You're saying yes and no? Yeah, I, saw a, I saw a yes and a no there. <laughs> slight superimposition of the fibular head, so we want to see this superimposed slightly on the tibial condyle. That's a good thing. Patella superimposed on the femur. If this is not superimposed on the femur, if I say patella going to the sides, one of two things might be wrong. Either I've rotated a leg, or what else could be wrong? The patient just can't be driving. Well, I just said that they're either rotated or centering. What else could be causing that patella to be off center? The angle. Let's say everything looks great, but this patella is like over here. Is it possible for it just to be unplayed? Dislocation. The patella can become dislocated, so make sure you look at the whole picture, not just the patella. If everything else looks good, but the patella is way over here it's likely the patella just became dislocated. So that's something you can't really help. Number four, open femorotibial joint space, equal width on both sides. That's just a fancy way of saying that open knee joint. Femorotibial joint space, you see that? Femorotibial joint space. It's like a nice little wave. Is it human anatomy pretty? Makes a nice little wave. Got two little pretty plateaus, beautiful mountain range, nice little wave in the sky there. The only one that sees that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's pretty. <laughs> they don't think it's pretty. <laughs> I got no comments on that. A lot of me. I think that was How disappointing. Weird. It's the marker for me. It's that digital marker. <laughs> it messes up the image. I feel you. I feel you. All right, guys, that's where we will stop today. So once again,